good morning to everyone, those on the stream. Thank you for your patience. And it is wonderful to be with you on this St. Patrick's Day weekend. Although I am not Irish, I do enjoy celebrating this uniquely American holiday with our neighbors and with you as well. My name is Bauer Evans. I'm one of the pastors. You may know that or you may not. And we're glad you're here with us this morning. It's my privilege to uh, lead us through a passage of Scripture in the Gospel of Mark, Mark's Gospel, uh, which is the second book of your New Testament. Uh, that is a difficult passage, uh, as you will see in a moment. And uh, I think a passage that unfortunately has been used for good purposes, but not necessarily the purposes that Mark intends when it is taught. As a I did a recent survey of pastors I look up to uh, on how they walk through this passage. Uh, and I'll point that out, not as a criticism, but as a invitation for you to consider what Mark is saying in light of Mark's gospel and its context. Uh, but maybe most... Um, encouragingly, despite its difficulty and the sensitivity topic, is uh, there is a verse in this passage that points to the identity of Jesus as revealed in the gospel that I find not only deeply uh, stirring, but remarkably motivating and encouraging as a follower of him. And if you're not a follower of him, you're going to hear through these verses a depiction of the identity of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that I think invites you to consider his claim upon your life. So let me pray, and I'm going to read the passage, Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 1 through 12. I'm reading through the ESV translation. If you're joining the stream, you'll see there's a link there called Bible Gateway. You can punch in Mark, the name, the number 10, and then the colon 1 to 12. The number's 1 to 12 for the verses, and uh, you can follow along with us. This is God's inspired, authoritative, and holy word. May he give us ears to listen carefully to him. Verse 1, and Jesus left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test Jesus, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife. He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, now he quotes Genesis, the first book of our Bibles. God made them male and female. The quote continues, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. End quote. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. This is God's word for us this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are both grateful for your word and also dependent this morning on your word. And we pray now that your spirit would do through your word, which as Christians 
we need and even long for. And that would reveal Jesus Christ to us and his good purposes in his unique call to disciples, to followers of Christ, to apply these passages to our lives. And Lord, I would also pray, as you are the God who who heals and restores and brings reconciliation, because the gospel declares you are a God of mercy to sinners like me. And when we repent and believe in your work on the cross and triumphant resurrection, there is more mercy in you than there is sin in us today. So may the glorious reality be a comfort to all of us as we consider this probing passage together. Pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. A simple point this morning, and then a simple outline which walks us through the passage, and then some points of application after we've taken some time to consider the passage together. It's simply this, Jesus Christ, right? Jesus the Christ uniquely calls his followers to discipleship and marriage for the sake of the gospel. And those words there are intentional in light of the context of this passage. Jesus Christ uniquely calls his followers to discipleship, meaning followership. If you're not familiar with that word, that's a word Christians use to describe what it means to be a Christian. We're following Jesus by faith, obeying his command, as our hearts have been changed by the Spirit through the message of the gospel. And for the sake of the gospel, we do that. And the passage really falls out into three simple sections. There's a question that's asked of Christ, the Messiah, and then there's a conflict that clearly ensues between the Pharisees and Jesus. And then there's a clarification sought for by the disciples about Christ's response to the Pharisees. And so Christ, in my second point, briefly spells out God's purpose for marriage according to Christ. And then there's implications, right, that I draw from the passage for us to reflect and consider for discipleship with the gospel in view. We are in a part of Mark that emphasizes two things, two things, and Mark has been explicit in those two realities. The first and primary emphasis is not about you, and it's not about me. It's about who is Christ Jesus. And so every verse, every verse points to his identity as the promised Messiah, as the one Jim read about and the band led us to sing about, the one foretold who would come to be Israel and our mighty God and Savior. And even in a passage like this, if we lose that focus, you miss the passage entirely. So we won't lose that focus because Mark doesn't allow us that focus to be lost. But then there's an implication for people who behold him as the Savior, and that is bringing our discipleship into marriage. Now, I am at a disadvantage because for a majority of us, we have been taught this passage as if this passage is a seminar in biblical marriage. And it is not. And it certainly does not exhaust the topic of marriage and divorce in the scriptures. Now, if there were time, or maybe we can meet after ukulele, we can revisit both in the Old Testament and the New, all, all, or even some, 
that the Bible teaches on marriage and divorce. Matthew's parallel account of this provides even more clarity than Mark does. And it's significant. And yet Mark didn't for a reason that I hope to make clear for you. It is God's kind intention to draw us to a passage like this that he can draw near to each of us but also because we are a church that does not skip passages because they're hard, as Dave led us last week in a difficult passage, because we exposit scripture. We go through entire books of scripture. We don't cherry pick and pick topics that are found in scripture. And so I am grateful, although desperate for God's grace, as my wife can attest, to lead us through this passage effectively and clearly and keep the focus on Christ as we do. So you can pray for me. I know you will. Let me suggest this by way of an analogy. When I was in high school, I only needed a D which I affectionately call the fat guy. A D in my most difficult class to graduate and receive credits for that class and go to the college that my mother primarily got me into. And so I wish I could say and stand before you that there was a sense of urgency in my soul that spring of 1981, when the chair of the department of the class that I had to pass, which was a repeat class for me, was trying to get me to pay attention in order to pass the class and go to the college that I'd been accepted into, because they made it clear, if he doesn't pass this class, we will not admit him. And so there's the chair of the department. And what he's encountering is a person that had, I'll do what is minimally required of me, which may or may not mean I do the homework, which may or may not mean I study, but I'll do what's minimally required of me. What's minimally required of me to pass this class and earn the credit? My other classes were fine. B's or C's, maybe even an A, one of them. C.S. Lewis, when he wrote Mere Christianity, took up that same sentiment. When he pivots in the second part of Mere Christianity, a book we make available in the lending library, to discipleship. And he observed in his day that what he called there is a taxpayer's mentality when it comes to Christ's call, unique call, and demands on disciples. And what he meant by that was this, and Jim, this was my first quote. The Christian way, he writes, is different, harder, and easier. Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and a branch there. I want to have the whole tree down. Love this one because I don't like Dennis. I don't want to drill the tooth or crown it, but I want to have it out. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think innocent as well as the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit. Jesus says, I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. I love that. My own shall and will become yours. So as we go through this passage, these are hard sayings. These are difficult challenges that he is issuing to the future leaders of the church, these apostles, these disciples. And yet there is grace abounding. For me, the worst sinner I know, and I hope you will discover with me the good news 
alongside the challenge. Let's consider the conflict and the question in verses one through five. I won't reread it again, but I will make some quick comments as you have it before you. It says that Jesus left there with the disciples to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds gathered to him again and again, as was his custom, he taught them. So as we read earlier in chapter nine, Jesus' public ministry in Galilee, the region of his upbringing, and where most of his public ministry has occurred, has concluded. So he's left the region of the Galilee to the north, and he's now traveling south to Judea, where Jerusalem is. And his fame precedes him. And because he is a savior of patience and compassion, it says in verse one, he teaches them, even though he has said already to his disciples, the crowds receive me because of my miracles, but they are hardened in heart. They don't believe in me. They don't, they don't believe in what I'm telling them to be true about my identity, but that is the kind of God. And he's also on his way to Jerusalem. What waits him in Judea is Jerusalem. Now, in Mark and Matthew and Luke's gospel, Jesus makes one journey to Jerusalem. But in John's gospel, he makes several. So in Mark's gospel, we see that the pace of the narrative slows down and the tension begins to rise as the climax of the gospel, which is his crucifixion and death, draws near. And so details are important to Mark, even though he shares what he shares in such a small amount of material. It says, it says that he is traveling as a pilgrim beyond the Jordan to the region of Judea. And the last time we were beyond the Jordan in Mark's gospel, there was another famous, if you will, individual who got on the bad side of the reigning king of that region. Do you remember that famous individual? All four gospels speak of that individual who ministered beyond the Jordan and whom Jesus went out to see beyond the Jordan and who in his preaching ministry irked Herod Antipas, John the Baptist. Jesus is in the region of John the Baptist on his way to Jerusalem. And so the Pharisees that now ask him this question in question in verse two. And the question is very simple. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? They may have had a hand in accusing John before Herod Antipas when Herod confronted Herod Antipas, because he married a woman, Herodias, who divorced her husband in order to marry Antipas. And in confronting Herod Antipas, he was saying in no uncertain terms, what you have done, Herod, is sinful. It's wrong. And how did John end his ministry? Beheaded. Executed martyred for confronting. And Jesus is now in that same region being confronted by Pharisees. And what is the question that they ask him? Of all the questions they could ask, why are they asking him this question? Because they know if he is who he says he is, if he answers it plainly, he will irk Herod Antipas again. And maybe King Herod will do what they want to do as they've been plotting since chapter three with the group of Herodians, the faction of Herodians that support Herodias, destroy this man. Maybe Herod will do what he did to John and 
arrest Jesus for answering this question plainly and kill him for us. That's the context of this entire discussion on marriage and divorce. I'm thankful for scholars like William Lane and James Edwards who pointed that out to me this week. And so the question isn't a question merely. It looks to be entrapment. You know what that is? It's a setup. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus answers them, well, what did Moses command you? And they reply, Moses allows a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. They're quoting Deuteronomy 24. They're quoting the Bible. They're quoting a verse in Deuteronomy 24 where there is an exception that allows for, in this case, a man to divorce his wife and to give her a certificate of divorce. And so they quote, they quote the exception clause when Jesus asked them, what did Moses command you. Now, last I checked, Moses commanded many things about marriage. Why would they be quoting the exception clause instead of quoting, in addition to the exception clause, which allows divorce, all of the commands and statements that protect the sacredness of marriage and elevate God's purposes? Could they be scheming to destroy Christ? Of course, and yet these are the theological conservatives. These are the ones that are supposed to defend the law. These are the ones that go the extra mile, right? They tie these in on their spices, let alone on their, to stay inside the boundaries of the law. And yet in that day, as was practiced and common, sadly, The grounds for a divorce could be as meager as a spouse ruining your meal. And Jewish tradition taught that's sufficient for you to break the bond and put the spouse away. Deuteronomy 24, which is indeed God's word, was to limit the effect of a hard heart in order to protect women who had few privileges and very little legal status in that day. It was meant to limit the problem of divorce, not serve as a license to this practice, And yet it appears that the Pharisees, like the culture of the day, were accentuating divorce as not the exception, but were actually encouraging it, or at least creating permissiveness rather than honoring and upholding and protecting God's purposes in this. And so Jesus rightly says that concession, which yes, is indeed God's word, was given as a response to your hardness of heart. And it does not reflect God's original intent and purpose. But his response to them no doubt escalates the tension and the conflict where he says in verse six, and he quotes now Genesis, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Genesis one and two, they know those verses. He's answering their question for them. They emphasize the exception in order perhaps to entrap him before King Herod Antipas. And Jesus emphasized the role in order that they would be reminded, you're here to give glory to God. 
That's the background. That's the context. Let's consider now God's purpose for marriage according to Christ, beginning in verse 6. Notice in verse 6 that Jesus transforms the discussion from talking about divorce to insisting, right, that God's original purpose for marriage and God's plan for marriage is rooted in God's purposes in creation. And that there is something in this union of a man and a woman through marriage that God intends that Jesus now affirms points forward to the purpose of his coming. He's reminding them not only what Moses has said, he is reaffirming to them and quoting Genesis as the promised Messiah that what Moses taught about marriage actually points forward to me. And you, the Pharisees, want to talk about divorce as the exception, and I instead am going to transition a conversation to marriage as the, quote, rule, because it points forward to me, my identity, who I am, and why I'm even here addressing you. Keep your eyes on that phrase there, and we'll get to it at the end. A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And then verse 9, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Last point. Following Christ and implications for discipleship with the gospel in view. Mark doesn't inform us of the response of the Pharisees, but he transitions to a private conversation beginning in verse 10 that he has with the disciples who ask again about this matter. And Jesus says to them in verse 11, whoever divorces wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now, I would again just draw our attention to parallel accounts, like in Matthew 19, where Jesus acknowledges there is a specific sin in marriage, sexual immorality, in Matthew 19, where it is a legitimate cause. In fact, the word cause is used for what cause, Matthew 19, is it legitimate for divorce to occur between two God followers, or in this case, to say, and he indicates that a marriage doesn't have to end in divorce, but where there has been sexual immorality and the harm it does to the marriage bond, to the covenant, to the declaration of, of becoming one, of loyalty, of, of putting you above everyone else. I'm getting convicted as I say all these things because these standards are high. Not because I've been unloyal, but there's levels to this loyalty. Jesus permits this exception, and it is God's gracious provision in a fallen world for one who has been sinned against in the marriage bond. I just, Lord, give me grace. The betrayal, the person must feel when that occurs. And the guilt, perhaps, the other person feels wrongly, I'm, I'm suggesting, but nonetheless guilt. Did I do something to cause this? 
and the, the breach of, of trust that occurs. Thinking of real situations before I was a Christian and then after I was a Christian and then after I became a pastor and like, I can't wrap my noodle around this. And so what I would want you to hear on whichever side of that you find yourself, that the gospel is good news for sinners. Whether you have been betrayed and grievously sinned against and you still feel the vestiges of that break or you are the one who broke it and committed that act. And the gospel is good news for sinners. Do we get this? Do we get this? That the gospel is good news for sinners. Do I get this? Jesus is good news for you today. And so when I hear in my own heart, which you have often heard if you've been with me for more than a few years, self-righteousness towards either group, that denies the gospel. And it forfeits, it forfeits the place of heralding good news to sinners in a broken world. Amen? Amen. And in a room like this, there are individuals not only who have experienced both sides of this, they've experienced the reality of this in their extended family. And they've had to wrestle with these realities. And so my prayer, my appeal to you is, first off, this passage is not exhaustive. Secondly, we want both the compassion of Christ and then the forthright of the convictions that Christ is bringing, that this is God's plan. A man and a woman I bring together in union, they will cleave to one another. And this union, this this connection, this vow should not be separated, which begs the question, Why? Why? Why is this a portrayal of the gospel? Why is Jesus using this discussion to say, behold, I am the promised Messiah? So while we acknowledge the challenges and difficulties and messiness of marriage life, yes, the highs and the lows, the mountain views and the fireworks in the valley, the distresses and the difficulties. We now want to acknowledge that. But you are not called to be perfect in order to experience the fullness of God's purposes in marriage because of the gospel. And lest I leave out our singles, I think you know this, I hope you do. Jesus was never married. So if experiencing fullness of God required marriage, how do you explain him? And Paul never married. So fullness of life requires, I just disagree with popular sentiment, which sounds really good in a movie moment. You complete me. And the music plays. And Jerry Maguire wins the Oscar or whatever. Of course, it's not biblical. We're complete in Christ. Yes? And the spirit that indwells in us John says in his letters, you have the anointing, you have the indwelling spirit. I may be leaving, you need nothing more. Jesus is with you, amen? 
So, and some of the great leaders in church history, Simeon, Charles Simeon of Simeon's Trust fame, the pastor, never married was a blissful bachelor serving the king. And there are women heroes that never married. Amen? And John Stott never married. He took a nap every day, too. I like that guy even more. <laughs> but if we are married, there are implications for discipleship in marriage. And if we're single, there's a vision here for marriage that is inspiring. So if you desire that, we pray for that. So let's encourage you. And may, by God's grace, we demonstrate both in our fallenness and Christ's sanctifying redemptiveness, that marriage is a gift from God. It's his institution. He says in verse 11, he's quoting, Whoever divorces his wife, this is Jesus training the disciples. And I'm going to add without legitimate grounds because there are passages in the Bible that create abuse, physical battery. Sexual morality. First Corinthians seven. Although we have to be very clear what Paul means. He speaks of a desertion by a non-believer in a marriage situation. Although there are grounds. If you divorce your spouse and marry another, you commit adultery. And if she divorces her husband, Herodias, and marries another, you commit adultery. There's no question in light of the context Jesus is signing his death warrant with that statement, although privately made. He just said the king and his wife are idolaters, and their marriage is subject to the judgment of God. And Mark, who's writing largely for a Gentile culture, for Christians in Rome, where divorce for trivial causes was legally permissible and common in culture. He's training the 12. He's training these future apostles. He's training them for leadership in the church in order to promote and protect God's original intention for marriage. He's preparing them for their mission of proclaiming the gospel and building the church to the ends of the earth. And he's clearly impressing upon them that they must not be conformed to the surrounding culture in relation to many things, but in this particular topic, the nature and purpose of marriage. They are not to look for ways to get out of their marriage. They are to deny themselves. They are to deny selfish impulses. They are to love their spouse. They are to serve their spouse and glorify God in and through marriage, things we teach and talk about and by grace try to apply. And so what does it mean to follow Jesus Christ in respect to marriage? Is that our marriages must not reflect the impermanent commitments of our culture and casual separations and divorces. If we would hear the unique call of Christ as his followers, we must not accept nor be conformed to impermanent commitments, I'm quoting James Edward, a scholar, and casual divorce. I'm not suggesting that if you are divorced, that your divorce was casual. I'm suggesting that in our culture, commitment and divorce in marriage has become commonplace. And if you've heard me say, when the culture has the flu, the church catches the cold. Often. So where's the gospel in view? Let me suggest this. And you and I can think about it more over coffee and green bagels, apparently. 
There is one in this passage who left his father in heaven. And came in search of his unfaithful bride. This theme is as old as the Old Testament, and it is now personified in the New. He came in search of his unfaithful bride, who had abandoned him, who had left him, who had committed spiritual, if you will, adultery. Out of his covenant loyalty to her, dies on the cross, fulfilling his marriage vows to her. And raised again, readies a supper, a supper, as Paul Gallant taught me to say, a marriage supper. Isn't it interesting that the Bible ends with a marriage supper? For the very ones whom he came for, he left his father and out of loyalty to his called people, clings to them by forsaking his life on the cross and taking upon himself as our substitute God's righteous wrath for our unfaithfulness and guilt and dying there, which we will celebrate and commemorate and reflect upon in just a matter of days, fulfills his marriage vow made in eternity past. So that calling us back to himself through the gospel, calling us to repent of our sins and believe in him, calling us to not... Follow him with a taxpayer mentality of minimal, but saying, I want all of you, therefore I give you all of me, broken as it might be, and limited and sinful as it often is. We anticipate that final meal, realizing that as disciples, when we are faithful in our marriage, albeit as sinners, we are painting a picture of a what to a watching world of this is what the gospel is. This is who Christ is. He is faithful. He not only denies himself, he denies his life. He denies his life for sinners like me. He lays down his life in order to have it taken up again that when he called me so many years ago, he would patiently, all these years later, remain faithful to me, even when I have faltered. Remain faithful to me through you and many of you encouraging me, praying for me, not as a pastor, but as a disciple. And I trust I doing the same, remaining faithful to me and demonstrating in my marriage to our kids and to our culture, there is one whose faithfulness to us. I, I can't want to know the word. Redounds. Is that a word? Multiplies what I'm demonstrating. When this passage has been turned primarily into a text on marriage, we lose sight of the gospel. And when we lose sight of the gospel, marriage loses all hope. Because what gives me today the fuel and the faith to deny myself and love my spouse a little more like Jesus loves me? I love the songs, but it's the one I meet through the song. I love the truth but it's the one I meet through the truth that I respond to. John said, the anointing is in you. His anointing is in you, 1 John 3. It's the one the Spirit has me meet in those moments that says, yes, today you can do something that you don't like to do. 
This is where my sanctification is. <sighs> make, a, make breakfast for your family yesterday morning when it's Saturday morning and you deserve a day off. Or play a game instead of watching TV when you hate to play board games and that's been your mission in life, you hate to play board games because your wife loves to play board games. And find whatever I'm lacking in that moment. Lord, give me a little more gospel vision to become a little more like Jesus, my faithful husband, and I being part of his bride, to deny myself, to deny my life through the power you provide. Marriage is about a man marrying a woman. Marriage is about the two becoming one. Divorce is a concession. It's a gracious provision, not an ideal according to Jesus where there has been infidelity with a view towards if the ideal is restoration and healing and reconciliation, that God is a God of repair. But marriage ultimately according to Jesus, unless you're like the Pharisees who make divorce all too easy, Marriage is how we display the reality of the gospel to a watching world because Christ, our bridegroom, has joined himself to us. Let's pray. Lord, so much more could be said or what was said could be said better or clearer. But nothing is more clear than that the route you are traveling in this passage is the typical route of a Jewish pilgrim to Jerusalem. You have already predicted your death and resurrection twice to your disciples. And you are preparing them for your triumphal entry and subsequent death on the cross for our sins. So that all we who believe in you, Lord Jesus and repent of our sins that we might be forgiven so that there might be hope for our lives and for our marriages. For we, we as Christians have been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. By your spirit, Lord, we pray for our relationships in this room and those we care for outside of this room. Desperately, this morning, We need your spirit to do what only you can do. Comfort, heal, restore. Dare I even suggest it, fix. And in the meantime, give us grace to continue to look to you. For we can't wait to be in heaven with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.